Hey everybody, welcome to Calvary Online. We're so excited that you joined us for Easter Sunday. We hope you've enjoyed our Good Friday service in person or had a chance to get to the Easter egg hunt. But today we have a service for you. We have a, a sermon for Pastor Bill. We have some worship for you. And after we have a really fun, exciting announcement, if you've been joining us online that you're gonna find out in the post credits. So we can't wait to hear from you. Enjoy the service. The sound of sorrow echoes in the streets. A song of grief, a hymn of defeat, a dirge. Injustice and tragedy converge on Calvary and the word was silenced. The hope of humanity lay lifeless in a borrowed tomb. As darkness loomed like a thousand years without the sun, the taste of fear on every tongue Longing to savor and see the goodness of a Savior, we could hardly hear the sound of two or three gathered in your name. We were scattered like skeptics, helpless and ashamed, sheep without a shepherd, disillusioned and dejected. We were desperate for something, for someone to rescue us from what Friday had done. But when the sun rose from its grave on the third day, Sunday came and everything changed. A melody of misery became a brilliant symphony of life. Oh, death, where is your sting? Swallowed up in victory, the greatest day in history was a Sunday. He is risen, we are forgiven. Let the church bells ring, let the set free sing a new song on Sunday. The reverberation of redemption, an open invitation for every tribe, tongue, and nation to come and see what God has done. His radical love, slain in the public square, but when they came to the grave, nobody was there. This is the good news, the fullness of an empty tomb, where death took its final breath at the hands of a man who had been dead himself until Sunday, when everything changed. Oh 
We're glad you've joined us for this service. We are talking about, and I've been talking about, listen, learn, live for the Father. And today is Easter. And so we're just trying to tie those together as we come to the end of the series. A uh, very important message today, of course, because when we talk about Easter, we talk about everything that is fundamental to what we believe and who we are as believers. I want to talk specifically about a part of that Easter story that relates to Jesus dramatically. And our, on our behalf, uh, my dad used to say simplistically, there were two things in life that were guaranteed. Uh, absolutely certain were death and taxes. And death is a part of all of our life. Life is terminal. Uh, I'm intrigued by the story of Steve Jobs, you know, of, of great fame, as you probably know. He was the speaker at Stanford University in 2005. And in his message that day, he said this, if you live each day as if it was your last, Someday you'll most certainly be right. And it, actually at that time when Steve Jobs made this speech, he had not yet revolutionized the cell phone industry. He had not yet unveiled the fastest selling computer of all time, nor had Apple become the most valuable company in the world. In the days from that speech until his death on October of 2011, Steve demonstrated how precious and valuable time can be. He went on to say in that address to Stanford University, Remembering that I'll be dead soon is the most important tool I've ever encountered to help me make the big choices in life. No one wants to die. Even people who want to go to heaven don't want to die to get there. Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. Have the courage to follow your heart and intuition they somehow already know what you truly want to become. So Steve actually recognized that life was short. It was terminal. It was 
As the Bible says, a vapor that appears and disappears is like a blade of grass that grows and is green and then withers and withers and dies. And, and so here we have the story of Jesus in Easter, and there's a wonderful verse of Scripture in a letter written by the Apostle Paul to a church in Thessalonica. And in chapter 1, uh, cha- for First Thessalonians, sorry, chapter 5, he says these words, He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Two of the most amazing words in all of the English language is a sentence in itself. It's completed, and the whole gospel is wrapped up in these two words. Everything about the human condition is wrapped up in these two words. Everything we believe about what Jesus did is wrapped up in these two words. And Paul says it so succinctly and so clearly. It says that he died. We're talking about Jesus. We're talking about death a little bit here. And the fact is that Jesus died. It, it was God's answer to the sin problem. Paul says that he died, the Son of God, become the Son of Man, gave his life. He gave his life so that you and I could have life in ourselves. He gave his life as a sacrifice for us. Because the problem is that we had sin in our life and we couldn't deal with it ourselves. And it robbed us of the best of God. And so the Bible says that Jesus died. He went to a cross, he hung on a cross, and he died. And so here in this process is this whole story of redemption. And, and when he died, he fulfilled over 300 prophecies in his life and, and in his death. And I, I got thinking about some of the things Jesus did and how that was impacted by this one moment, this one moment on Good Friday coming to Easter soon. He was born of a virgin on a night marked by angels and shepherds, but he died. He was visited by foreign dignitaries who celebrated his birth with gifts and reverence, but he died. He lived as a child in a small community in Israel, as a normal Jewish boy, but he died. As a very young man, he astounded a group of religious leaders of his day with his wisdom and understanding of the kingdom of God, but he died. He called a few ordinary people to be his disciples, and they left their families and occupations without question to follow him, but he died. He walked on water, turned water into wine, and multiplied loaves and fish, but he died. He gave sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, new flesh to the leprous, health to a person with an issue of blood, and even healed the common cold, but he died. He brought deliverance to the demoniac, happiness to the father of a dying child, and hope to, a desp- to despised members of society, but he died. He gave value and credibility to a crippled man at the pool of Bethesda, significance to a tax collector, attention to a widow, approval to a woman who was misjudged, and truth to the masses. But he died. He forgave a paralytic lowered through the roof of a house and a woman accused by religious zealots, and in so doing so, declared his ability to forgive sins. But he died. He confronted money changers in the temple, a rich young ruler, and the religious leaders of his day, but he died. He comforted the weak, instructed those seeking truth, healed the sick, and loved outcasts and the forgotten Samaritans and the lost, but he died. He raised the widow's son and his friend Lazarus from death, but he died. He hung on a cross and gave his life an eternal sacrifice for the world that God loved and that he loved, and he died. See, that's the message of Easter. The message of Easter is that the Christ died. It doesn't finish there. That's the beginning of the message of Easter. And if you read this verse, it's these few simple words. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. The next two words are equally important, equally valuable, because they give credence to all that he did. It makes such truth and such meaning for us, because it says he died for us. For you and me, ordinary people, sinful people, lost people, broken, wounded, hurting people, he died for us. I love how Paul puts it again, the same writers to Thessalonica, to the church in Rome, he says these words, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Two more words of incredible value. The Son of God. The incarnate Son of Man, the incarnate Son of God, came to earth and gave his life for us. We could not fix it ourselves. We would never have chosen this way to do it. Only the Lamb of God could take away the sin of the world. Only the spotless, sin, sinless Son of God, the spotless, sinless Son of God, only he could carry the weight of guilt and judgment on your, of your sin and mine. The Bible says, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
The wrath of God was poured out on him for us. Peter says, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. God did it for us. God has sent his son to do it for us. Hebrews says, For this reason Christ is the mediator, the, the initiator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from their sins. I love what Paul says again in another book to the sentence written to the church in Corinth. And he died for all those who should, so let me say it again. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. He died for us. He died on our behalf. There's a lot of implications in that. The truth is he tasted death. There is no part of death, and I love this. I've got old, and the older I get, I realize I'm closer and closer to that moment. But, but when Jesus died, here's, here's what that means. There is no part of death he does not understand. There is no part of death he has not tasted it. He tasted it all. He did it for us. And so when we come to that moment, we have great hope in him because, because he died for us and because he knows what death is. And the truth is, he died so we don't. And when his friend Lazarus had died, he goes and meets with Mary and Martha, his two sisters, and he says to Martha these amazing words. He said, I am the resurrection and the life who believes in me, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? The truth is that because he died for us, there's a promise and there's a hope. And it gets richer than that. It gets even better than that. It says, he died for us so that. So that what? That's, a, that's an implication. What does it mean? So that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. What do you mean live together with him? I thought he died. Well, he did. But that's the message of Easter, isn't it? That the grave could not hold him. That on that third day, on that Sunday morning, they went to the grave and the stone was rolled away and the, the cloth that they had wrapped him with for his burial was lying there, but he was not. He was risen. The Bible's so clear on this. Uh, Jesus Christ who died, more than that, was raised to life. It's at the right hand of God interceding for us. For this very reason Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. Friends, everything we believe is wrapped up in Easter. Everything we know and understand of Christianity is wrapped up in Easter. I actually quite love how Andy Stanley put it. He said this. He said, we don't have a resurrection because we have a Bible. We have a Bible because there was a resurrection. One of the great, great truths of Christendom is that Jesus rose again. The grave could not hold him. Someone once said that if only one person had ever repented and come to faith, Jesus would have still died. I don't know if that's true because God in his wisdom knew that would be multitudes would come to faith. But I do know this, the grave could not hold him. The sinless Lamb of God was never staying in the ground because the Son of Man was truly and also the Son of God. He lives with eternal life and he was going to rise again regardless. Maybe that's why God says to us that you should be thinking about these things. You should be thinking about the eternity, not just the now, but also the there. Because he calls us, he says, I, I did this so you can be with me. I, I want you to be with me. Together with him are the words that Paul uses. So I, I love how Paul, again, in another book, another letter to a church in Colossae, says these words, Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. So when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. There's the promise that this Christ who is risen will touch us with resurrection life, and we will be together with him. Did you notice what he said? Whether awake or asleep, we'll be with him. What that means is this. Awake simply means the life we live now. Life who we are, what we are right now. The life we have in God right now is with him. He is with us. It's an amazing story of truth. It's an amazing story of truth. But the other side of that is one day we will die. Life is terminal. And we'll be with them then as well. For he, they use the word asleep. Paul uses this neat little word to talk about dying and death. So, but whether you're awake or asleep, you've already died, you've died. 
And then he goes on and says to the church in Corinth in another letter, Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how we come to be able to be with him. Because he overcomes sin and death and hell. And one day we also will rise again because he has given us eternal life. That, that's, that's really the message of Easter. So whether you're awake or asleep, we are together with him. I, I love how Paul puts it in, in, again, in this letter to the Corinthians. And I really like the message version of it. He says this. This is for people that are awake still, but looking and anticipating the fact that one day we will go asleep, but we'll wake eternally with him. Here's what he says. For instance, we know that when these bodies of ours are taken down like tents and folded away, they will be replaced by resurrection bodies in heaven. God made, not handmade. And we'll never have to relocate our tents again. Sometimes we can hardly wait to move, and so we cry out in frustration. Compared to what's coming, living conditions around here seem like a stopover in an unfurnished shack, and we're tired of it. We've been given a glimpse of the real thing, our true home, our resurrection bodies. The Spirit of God whets our appetite by giving us a taste of what's ahead. He puts a little heaven in our hearts so that we'll never settle for less. That's why we live with such good cheer. You won't see us drooping our heads or dragging our feet. Cramped conditions here don't get us down. They only remind us of the spacious living conditions ahead. It's what we trust in but don't yet see that keeps us going. Do you suppose a few ruts in the road or rocks in the path are going to stop us? But when the time comes, we'll be plenty ready to exchange exile for homecoming. But neither exile nor homecoming is the main thing. Cheerfully pleasing God is the main thing. And that's what we aim to do regardless of our conditions. I mention it often because I guess I'm just aware of being old. I am 77 now. I've been incredibly blessed with great health, actually. It's just interesting. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, for sure, I know that I have never missed a day's work for sickness since at least 1985. And I think I can go back to 80. Just never missed a day for sickness. It, I suppose I've had common colds a little bit, and I actually picked up a bit of a bug a few weeks ago, and it happened to, I worked Saturday to Wednesday. I happened to be sick a little Thursday, Friday, but never missed a day. And it wasn't serious, and if I had been at work, I would have come. Anyway, uh, along the way, I suppose I did have a couple of days that I did miss. I did fall and break my ankle once, and I was home for a day, just in the process of getting a cast on. And I worked from home that day. I was home, but I still worked. And then I couldn't really stand the idea of being at home. So I rented a wheelchair for a couple of days and then finally went to crutches. Uh, and another time, it was kind of interesting, I, I discovered that, that I had two electrical systems in the heart. All of my life, from the time I was just young, my heart would kick into overdrive and beat fast and hard and up to 225 beats a minute. And they finally figured out what was wrong uh, when I, in the 90s, I got to the place where I couldn't stop it. I used to be able to slow down and lie down and hold my breath and it would quit and go back to normal. So what would happen is the, the one electrical system would short out the other and only the top half of the heart would beat. And so that was kind of a little bit interesting. And, and then I couldn't get them to stop it. If it would go long enough, you pass out and then the heart goes back to normal. Anyway, they did a, I did miss three days there because they did a catheter ablation and they went in and burnt one of the electrical systems out. Not a heart issue, just an electrical issue. I didn't really call that being sick. I got to the hospital Friday and drove three hours on Saturday, Saturday and preached twice on Sunday morning and evening and three hours back that night and back in the office on Monday. Just never really been sick. And I was doing spiritual emphasis days in a Bible college in Alberta in, uh, called Vanguard a few years ago, and, uh, and I got sick. Like, really, really got sick. Like, really got sick. I was lightheaded, headaches and pain and nausea, and every bone in my body felt like it was aching. I, it was hard to look and see, and, and, you know, what do you do? You're a guest speaker, and you're there, so you just carry on. And did, and I have no idea if it was good or bad, because I was so unaware, just aware of how ill I felt. 
And I, I went to the airport on the way home and, and I'm sitting there just feeling as miserable as could be. And this young couple actually came up to me and said, are you okay? You look really awful. And I said, I know I feel really awful, but it's okay because I'm going home. I was heading home to my wife and that was hopeful. And I'm sitting on the plane now heading home and I, and I got thinking about it and I realized, huh, I've never been sick. I like I've never been sick. I don't get colds like other people do. I don't get flus. I just, I've just never been sick. And then I hit me, well, huh, I've never been sick. Maybe this is the beginning of the end. Maybe this is God preparing me for something. Maybe this is God saying to me, it's over. Maybe this is God saying, this is it. And I remember sitting in that plane and thinking about the death and resurrection of Jesus what he had done for us. And I can say to you that I, uh, I'm grateful that because of him, I knew that I was ready. It didn't matter. It didn't matter if I, see, because whether we're awake or asleep, it just didn't matter. And when I got better, a few days later, there was a little, a little um, sadness in that, a little yearning, a little, a little sense that, wow, um, it's better there than here. There's more fullness there than here. There's less pain there than here. There's no pain there. There's no sickness or death or dying there. It's a wonderful thing to know a living Savior, friends. It's a wonderful thing to know a living Savior. He died. He died for us. He died for us. So that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live. Oh, that's the good part. We will live forever. And even better than living forever. We live forever together with him. Let's pray for a minute. God, this is such an amazing Easter story, Easter truth. On Good Friday, Jesus died. Died for us. But on Sunday, he rose again so he could have us with him forever. So the presence of God could touch and fill our lives. So that while we're here on earth, we just know his presence. We know his love. We know his fullness. We know the wonder of his grace. And somehow in that knowing, we recognize what he's done for us with great thanksgiving. And it puts a little yearning in our hearts. Because we know that he rose from the dead. And we now live in his resurrection life with the promise in us that when we die, we too shall rise again. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. While we go to be with him at the moment of death, there will come a moment when our bodies will even rise again, just like his. Be united to our soul and spirit, and we'll forever be with the Lord. Ah, be encouraged as we pray to God today. Just be encouraged in your soul that you belong to him and he belongs to you. And these words are for you and for me. He died so that we can be together forever. He died for us. So whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Have a great Easter. Blessing. Oh, my.
strong worship you if it puts me in the fire. Well, I'll rejoice because you're there too. Well, I won't be fooled by feelings. I hold fast to what is true. But if the cross brings transformation, well, I'll be crucified with you. Because death is just a doorway to the resurrection life. If I join you in your suffering, and I'll join you when you rise. And you returning glory with all the angels and the saints. My heart will still be seen. My song will be the same. And oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Sing it all. Christ be magnified for the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. Sing it all. Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. The altar of my life, Christ be magnified in me. We hope you felt encouraged today by Pastor Bill's message. What an incredible moment that we have to celebrate the Easter service and what Easter means to us as Christians. Jesus died for us, he rose again, and now we can have a relationship with him and we can live forever, like Pastor Bill was saying, with Jesus. So what an incredible thing. If you have any questions about anything that was said today or if you are, uh, just wanna to talk to a pastor, feel free to message us in the description. You'll see a link there. You can reach out to us, we'd love to hear from you. And here's a special announcement. What we're gonna do, if you've been joining us online and maybe you haven't felt like you're part of the community, what we're doing is launching a special Facebook group. You can find the link in the bio. And if you wanna join us each Sunday, you can share highlights. If you wanna to talk to other people who are joining in online like you, we would love to have you part of the community. Hope to see you soon. 